Recording. Okay. So our lesson this week is on benthic communities. We talked about pelagic communities last week. Um, all right, quickly, you guys, you guys remember what pelagic communities are? So pelagic environments, uh, they're organisms that live where? Live on the seafloor. Live on the seafloor? Well, live in the sea. In the sea. In the water, in the right? Water. So don't live on the seafloor. I'm going to close this door. Uh, the pelagic organisms are those that live in the water called in the water. Today we're going to be talking about benthic organisms that are organisms that live on the seafloor. Sea floor. Sea floor. Yes. So live on the seafloor. Yes, there is. Uh, and so, uh, to start off, talk about how organisms are distributed on the sea floor. Okay, and there's kind of different three different ways in which organisms can be distributed. They can be distributed distributed randomly. They can be clumped together in different locations, or they can uh, have a uniform distribution. Now, uh, a random distribution just means they're, they're, they're randomly found on the sea floor, and that would imply that the location of one organism has, has absolutely no bearing on other organisms. Okay? And that's the only way they can be truly random, that they do not influence one another. Okay? Do you think that's the case? Do you think organisms have absolutely no influence on one another? I, I think they do. They do. So, um, benthic organisms are, are not just randomly distributed across the sea floor. Uh, another type of distribution is uniform. That's where there's an, it's kind of the opposite of uh, uniform, where there's an equal spacing between individuals. A uh, similar example on the slide is the trees in an orchard are planted in rows with a, that's okay, with set distance between each tree. <laughs> so do you think that benthic organisms are uniformly distributed? So that there's equal spacing between. So yes. Yeah, like the trees of a, like the trees in, in the an forest. orchard. Not in the forest. Those aren't uniformly spaced. Like the tree, uh, like apple trees in an orchard. Mm -hmm. Those are uniformly spaced. Do you think we find that? No. No, that's not natural, right? So benthic organisms are not um, distributed randomly or uniformly. They are clumped, okay? And why are they are clumped? It's because the conditions that are favorable for the organisms exist in particular locations, and organisms will be clumped around those locations, okay? So, uh, so we have a clumped distribution occurs when conditions for growth are optimal in small areas because of the physical protection, nutrient concentration, initial dispersion, dispersal, sorry, or the social interaction. Okay, so a good example is uh, organisms will tend to be clumped, say, around a coral reef. Right? You just don't have organisms distributed randomly across the abyssal plains. They're clumped in regions where there's protection, there's nutrients, so forth, that are where the conditions are favorable. So here's a uh, figure showing. Um, diagrams of the different types of distribution. So diagram A, it's a random distribution, or the blue dots are just randomly placed. 
B is clumped, which is the type of distribution that uh, benthic organisms are, are usually found in. And uh, finally, C is uniform distribution. There's equal spacing between uh, individuals, which is not usually found in nature either. So now we're going to move to uh, the uh, one of the main primary producers of benthic communities. So the, the largest primary producers of pelagic communities were the phytoplankton photosynthetic plankton. But um, of benthic organisms, the uh, most um, primary productivity is the result of seaweed. Okay, uh, And so we're talking a little bit about seaweed, uh, some about seaweed, and then a little bit about marine plants. So seaweed, there's several different types, and, and, and they're classified by the type of pigment that the seaweed have. Uh, and so we have these chlorophytes, phaophytes, and rhodophytes. Now chlorophytes, you might see that their name kind of resembles that term chlorophyll. Does anyone remember what chlorophyll is? Would be something that would make you um, pass out? That's chloroform. Chlorophyll is a molecule that is essential for what process? It's green. I'll give you a hint. It's in the leaves of plants. What do the leaves of plants do? That's really important. Oxygen. Oxygen is created by this process where they take in light and make food. Photosynthesis, 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 right? Photosynthesis. So chlorophyll is um, a necessary molecule for photosynthesis. And so chlorophytes, they're, um, they're green due to the presence of chlorophyll in them. And that chlorophyll is present for photosynthesis. And they lack any other pigments or accessory pigments. So they're like the leaves on a on a typical tree. They're green because all there is is chlorophyll. So all green seaweeds have strictly chlorophyll. For phaophytes, they are brown. Okay, They're brown. Uh, a very common phaophyte is kelp. You know, if we're familiar with kelp. Um, they contain chlorophyll, like the chlorophytes, because that is the primary molecule used in photosynthesis. But they also have a secondary pigment in them that helps aid in the process of photosynthesis called fucoxanthin. Uh, that fucoxanthin, that accessory pigment, that is what gives the seaweed, these phaophytes, their brown color. And finally, the rhodophytes, these are seaweeds that are red in color. And because they have these other accessory pigments that give them uh, the red color. And these are some of the most abundant type of seaweed, these red ones. And so um, algae is seaweed are pretty much the same thing, right? Um, seaweed is not a plant. It's technically considered what's known as a protist. Okay, and same thing as algae. So seaweed is nothing but very complex algae. Uh, and so that red tide, I'm familiar with red tide, uh, that is pretty similar to pretty much red seaweed. And you often go to beaches and you find that red seaweed washed up on shore. So those are rhodophytes, a very common type of seaweed. So what makes them red is some uh, auxiliary pigments they have. Uh, similar to, is anyone familiar with the Japanese maple tree? So their leaves are just red all year around. They're not, they're not green. It doesn't mean there's not chlorophyll. There has to be chlorophyll in the leaves for photosynthesis. It's just that there's other pigments in there as well that give it a red color. Okay, so these rhodophytes are similar to uh, a Japanese maple. So here we can see the different parts of uh, the uh, body of of uh, seaweed. So this is kelp, and kelp are, are a very common type of seaweed. Uh, they grow in these large forests. Kind of they're called kind of kelp beds or kelp forests. 
and they can grow to extreme heights. Uh, they can grow very fast as well. If you see over here, the organisms can grow at a rate of 50 centimeters, which is 20 inches per day, and reach a total length of 40 meters or 132 feet. So um, they're quite impressive how much, uh, how fast, and how much they can grow. And so the parts of, uh, say, a seaweed. So these, <clears throat> the main body. Okay. So the main body is called the thallus, okay? So this is the thallus. Where the thallus attaches itself to the sea floor, that's called the holdfast, okay? This anchoring structure. Now that looks like, they look like roots, correct? They're not. They're not roots. It's just purely a structure that anchors the thallus to the sea floor, so it just doesn't float away. And then it has um, <clears throat> these little, they look like stems, but they're not technically stems. They're called stipe. And these, coming from these stems, we have blades, which look like leaves, but we, they are called blades for algae uh, and seaweed. And um, where plants have this material called um, cellulose, which is... Uh, a sugar that allows for the building of strong cellular walls, that that's the crunch, that, that's the cellulose breaking when you bite into, say, like a carrot, or it's the cellulose breaking whenever you break a stick or something. So it gives the plant that rigidity, some level of rigidity. Seaweed doesn't have that. Okay, Seaweed are not plants. They're, as I said, they're protists, basically algae. They don't have that. And so how do they hold themselves upright if they don't have that molecule, that cellulose, to make a rigid structure? Well, they use these little things called gas bladders. So these little gas bladders have gas in them, and they float, and that's what holds the thallus of the seaweed upright. Now, <clears throat> one major way that seaweed is different from plants is that a plant is vascular which means it transports materials throughout its body, just like us, right? We move, we, we have a circulatory system, and we move uh, fluid throughout our body to distribute needed gases uh, and nutrients and so forth. Well, a plant does the same thing, right? A plant needs nutrients, which it derives from the soil. It needs water, which it derives from the soil. And those nutrients in the water, they go up into the plant, uh, through the vascular system of the plant. So they go from the roots up into the, the tree or the plant. And then those, that water and those nutrients are taken to where photosynthesis occurs in the leaves of the plant. In the leaves of the plant is where carbon dioxide is absorbed and it's where light is absorbed. So the carbon dioxide, the light, the water, and the nutrients are all used in the process of photosynthesis. So the sugars that are made through the process of photosynthesis are then distributed throughout the plant's body through its vascular system. So there's parts of a plant where it photosynthesizes, basically every part that's green, and there's parts of the plant where there is no photosynthesis, say like the brown part of a tree where there's the trunk. Right? Well, seaweed isn't vascular because it doesn't need to be. It Everything, all of the necessary ingredients for photosynthesis are present everywhere in its body. A tree has to move water from its roots and nutrients from its roots up to where the photosynthesis is occurring in the leaves, where the water is completely surrounding the seaweed, right? The nutrients is dissolved in that water, so the nutrients are completely surrounding the seaweed. There's carbon dioxide dissolved in the water, so there's carbon dioxide all around the seaweed, and there's light hitting the seaweed everywhere. And so photosynthesis literally occurs in every part of seaweed. And it doesn't need to move nutrients or sugars or anything around in it because photosynthesis is literally occurring everywhere in the seaweed. So that's how it's different from plants. And uh, for example, uh, you know, to illustrate this, this vascular nature of plants during the fall in temperate environments like climates like here in 
uh, Rhode Island, when the amount of sunlight decreases, the plants withdraw all their chlorophyll and all the other um, nutrients from the leaves, and that's why the leaves turn colors, right? Because all the chlorophyll is removed from them. They're no longer green. They turn brown, red, orange, and the leaves die and fall off. And all those sugars go into the trunk of the tree for the tree to live off of because the tree needs food, right? And so it's not photosynthesizing, so it pulls all those sugars in and lives off them throughout the winter. Okay, so that's the tree moving uh, material through its body. But seaweed does not do that because uh, they are not vascular like plants. See the whole fast? Yes. <clears throat> I know they say plants have a root system mm -hmm. that is vast like the plant is. Yeah. So, like, how deep would a the rooting system. How down. deep is that? Well, I don't think it's that deep. Like on the floor. Yeah, so these are just deep enough because that root system is serving two purposes. It's to anchor the plant and it's to acquire roots, I mean water and nutrients. Where this hold fast is only serving one purpose, and that's to anchor the phallus. It's the hold fast, right? That's why it's called the hold fast. It's not a, it's not acquiring Anything. water or nutrients. Yeah. Okay, good question. I got another question though, regarding the gas bladder. Would we see that on seaweed locally around here? Do you call it seaweed? Would we... Yeah, if you look at kelp, uh, if it's if it's if it's washed ashore, usually those gas bladders will look deflated and their heart might not be as easy to see. And uh, and some species of seaweed don't have them because some species of seaweed they spend their whole lives just floating on the sea on the sea surface. Okay, because I mean it's at the spots along the ocean I've seen it. It looks like almost like strips of lasagna. Yep, that's that's yep, that's the kelp. And those those are you're seeing the blades. If you could see the whole the whole uh, structure, then below those blades you should see a gas bladder right. on kelp. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because those, those strips of kelp they, that look like lasagna, it yep. looks like something that was they're kind of wavy. Else. What's that? Yeah, it, it's been broken off with something else. Yeah, because those are broken off. So that's a stipe. Right, those those blades. Uh, sorry, it's not a stipe. Those blade, those are blades that have broken off of the stipe, which are look like the stems. They stem off of the thallus. And normally, what we see that's that's in the surf here. I mean, normally that would be fairly deep water. Uh, well, these these can grow. Uh, so you can have kelp that's you know growing from water that's up to 132 feet deep. Right, because that's how tall they can grow. So, so uh, you can there's these very large kelp beds that exist uh, in different coastal waters. It has to be coastal waters because that's the only place where the water is shallow enough. Right. A lot of times I'll go clogging out on Prudence Island and I'll be digging along too. And then there's, there's a lot of the different type of seaweed too. It's just uh, kind of like a very some of this type kind of grows straight up. It's that's that, like grass. Is that eel grass? Right. Yeah, that's a different type of seaweed. Yep. Mm. But that wouldn't have that would they don't have any type of gas bladders on, on them. In other words, it's something to kind of look at. Yeah, well if they're not that long, if they're not that large, they don't necessarily need it, right? But this if these can live in very deep water and they want to be as close to the surface as possible. And so that's why they have these gas bladders. All right. Because if they didn't have these gas bladders and the currents, you know, moving them back and forth, you know, they could get twisted together because this is just one. They usually grow there's multiple, multiple of them going all around. It's like a forest of kelp. Mm -hmm. So it helps keep them upright and they don't get twisted around each other <coughs> as much and so forth. Um, if you watched Finding Finding Dory, right, the most recent Disney Pixar movie, uh, there's a couple scenes that are in the kelp forest, right, or they're swimming in around the kelp, um, and it just looks like these structures that are just growing up through the water, must attach to the seafloor. So here is a, a distribution of, of kelp beds. That's the yellow. So these large forests of kelp that grow in the coastal waters and mangroves. Mangroves are a different type of organism. They're not seaweed. They are a marine plant. And you can see that mangroves, um, unlike kelp, which kelp tend to favor you know, cooler, more temperate conditions, okay, and they don't, you don't find them at low latitudes in the tropics so much, 
mangroves like warmer, more tropical conditions. Um, and so, for instance, the marine plants are uh, mangroves growing in the Everglades. Mangroves being plants, they have roots that go down into the ground for water and nutrients. You say, well, they, mangroves actually grow in very shallow water. It's like, well, you know, there's water all around them. Why do they, and there should be nutrients dissolved in that water. Why do they need roots going down to the ground? Well, those roots, as I said, help anchor them. But also, plants need fresh water. Salt water kills plants. Okay. Uh, if the water is too salty, it will kill plants. So uh, mangroves have these very complex root structures that uh, go deep beneath the surface to tap into the fresh groundwater. And that's where they get their source of water. Um, and then we have the seagrass uh, that can grow, uh, forms in tidal pools where it gets uh, some fresh water periodically due to precipitation and other sources that it uh, uses. And so uh, there's very, very few species of marine plants, okay? Most of what looks like vegetation that you see in the ocean is, in fact, seaweed, and which is basically algae, okay? Seaweed are just multicellular organisms that are algae. Uh, they're not plants. Is there uh, some of the fungus of them that are edible, like in uh, Portuguese soup? Oh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of seaweeds edible. Um, I forget what it's called. What is that stuff called? Uh, the sushi is wrapped in seaweed, right? Okay. Uh, I forget what it's called. Nami is it Nami? No, that's a wave. And, yeah, yeah, tsunami, harbor wave. Yeah, I forget what it's called. But he's mentioned it because it's, uh, it's came up the uh, elevator today at the, uh, at the kind of like in the kitchen there where they had they they got Portuguese soup out there today. I see. I see we did. Yeah. And oh, they also sell like seaweed salad and stuff like like that too. Seaweed mm -hmm. salad. It's good. Yeah. So seaweed a lot of, but some seaweeds are toxic, right? Well, they produce toxins. Uh, so this just a f couple months ago, there was an algal bloom. Uh, in the bay, Narragansett Bay, that was producing toxins that were uh, that they were afraid that were being absorbed by the shellfish. Yeah, they fish. yeah so there was an emergency ban on the uh, shellfish. So that's algae, which is more simpler organisms, but um, but um, but seaweed is just complex algae, right? Uh, where uh, you know, and the, those are just a little more basic, simple algae, the stuff that was, those algal blooms, and so forth, like the red tide, and so forth. All right, now, um, we talk about benthic communities, one of the most densely populated um, habitats, benthic habitats, are estuaries. Now, we already spoke about estuaries uh, to some extent, when we talked about coasts, uh, but as we said then, estuaries are where fresh and salt water mix. And so in estuaries, uh, there is a large variation in salinity and temperature through time. Usually with the tidal cycle, right, at high tide, there's going to be higher salinity in the water in the estuaries. At low tide, there's going to be a lower salinity. And if there's a precipitation event on land and the uh, flow rate in the river is larger, there's going to be lower salinity in the uh, estuary. Um, and so forth. So there's large ranges in physical conditions in estuaries that the organisms have to adapt to, but they're very productive because there's so much nutrients in these estuaries because the fresh water flowing into them from the rivers flushes nutrients into them. And so the mass of living matter per unit area in estuaries is among the highest of all habitats on the planet. So estuaries are very, very productive um, benthic habitats. And as far as pelagic species go, they take advantage of all that biological productivity that occurs in these estuaries. And often, if you go into an estuary, you'll find a bunch of small fish. 
because what happens is these estuaries act as nurseries for pelagic species. So uh, young fish will either be born in an estuary or find their way into an estuary where they'll live and grow in there, eating and growing, and they don't have, they're not around large predators to be preyed upon. So they act as nurseries for um, a pelagic species. And uh, there's few plankton. There's few plankton because uh, a lot of plankton are washed out to sea by the tides, flush out to sea by the flush water, plus uh, all the pelagic species and stuff that would be eating them in there that they grow. So what's not washed out is usually eaten. So there's not as much plankton in estuaries as there are in, in the open ocean and pelagic environments. So here is a, uh, a photo of an estuary. Okay, so it looks like the, uh, the ocean opens up over here, and that's probably a, a river coming down here and it opens up the ocean. So the water height will be higher at low, a high tide and lower at low tide. But you can see there's marsh, and so you have all these grasses, um, and then you have uh, many different types of benthic species living in here, like shellfish, crabs, and so forth. And then you have pelagic species living in there as well. Uh, here's an example. There's uh, some snails living in an estuary. So this is probably at low tide, and these snails are uh, currently exposed at low tide. These remind me a lot if you go to a uh, like a rocky coast in Rhode Island, there's, you'll find a bunch of snails. There are periwinkles. Remember with periwinkles? There are snails. Uh, there are common snail found in rocky coasts. Um, you can cook them and you can pluck them out with a toothpick and eat them. Very, very tiny ones that really attach themselves to the rocks that you normally see little kids picking. Exactly. That was the periwinkles. Mm -hmm. So speaking about those rocky shorelines, that brings us to another benthic habitat. Those are rocky intertidal communities. And what an intertidal uh, habitat is, that is the sea floor that uh, exists between the high tide and the low tide. Okay, So that's the intertidal region. That's uh, technically considered to be the littoral zone. Okay, that, That's the the littoral zone, the intertidal zone. And so organisms that live in the intertidal zone, they have to be able to be exposed to air for some period of time, right? Depending on how close to the high tide line or how close to low tide line they are, they're going to be exposed for different amounts of time each day, right? Uh, and so uh, these rocky intertidal communities are actually some of the most densely populated areas as well. Uh, they have both sessile and modal organisms. Does anyone want to take a guess what it means to be sessile or what it means to be modal? So a, I'll give you an example. A sessile organism would be like a sea urchin. Well, stationary. Stationary. Yep, exactly. And a modal would be like a crab. They, they can move. So sessile organisms are... Uh, stationary on the seafloor, while modal organisms can move about the seafloor. Uh, problems that exist on these rocky intertidal coast, uh, coastlines, these communities, is that uh, the waves crash pretty hard on these rocks. Okay, the wave energy is not diffused by washing up a uh, a, a sandy beach, so there's a lot of wave shock. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of rocks to hide behind, a lot of cracks to hide in between, so you can avoid that wave shock. Desiccation, uh, that's drying out. Okay, so you, in living in these intertidal communities, you have to uh, be able to withstand being exposed to air, uh, and that's because of the tides. And you, you have to be able to withstand those currents, the flood currents coming in and the ebb currents coming out. The ebb currents take you out to sea, uh, that could be problematic for you. So you have to be able to handle the the, um, the tides. But there's many habitats and niches. In these rocky intertidal communities, you have tidal pools that have a very large uh, number and diversity of organisms living in them. You have the cracks and fissures in the rocks that 
that different organisms live in, hide in. Uh, there's a lot of different food sources available to these organisms. There's algae that grows on the rock, right? That's what the snails are living on a rock. So that's what they're doing. They're eating the algae that's growing on the rock. Uh, that's a lot of the crabs do. The crabs will eat the algae off of the rock that grow on the rock, okay? Because that rock provides a stable foundation for that algae to grow on, and that's a very popular food source. And then, uh, that, so in those rocky intertidal communities, those algae are the primary producers, right? They're the photosynthetic organisms, and then the snails and the crabs are the primary consumers, and then you have the organisms that are eating the snails and the crabs, those are the secondary consumers, okay? Um, and it's interesting because we, we think of rocky coastlines as being very kind of uh, harsh and inhospitable, but the, the contrary is true. They're very hospitable. So we have, we, have, we have different species of coral. We have barnacles. We have many different types of, uh, of, of shellfish. Uh, uh, we have crabs, crustacean, anemones, some fish. Uh, so we have some nectons even living in here. And then we have some birds and maybe some, some mammals. We have a large uh, number and diversity of organisms living in these rocky intertidal communities, right? Because there's, there's, there's basically a lot of different things that organisms can do. There's a lot of different niches that they can fill. You can hide from predators in rocks. Uh, living in these tidal pools, you don't have to worry about big fish eating you or so forth. Um, and there's a lot of places you can hide to ambush prey if you're a predator. And so here's an example of algae growing on the rocks of a rocky um, intertidal community. And the interesting thing is uh, this is landward and this is seaward. And this is at low tide. You can see the color of the algae changes with distance away from the low tide line. So the low tide line's down here, the high tide line's down here, up here. And so these different colors are different species of algae. And each of these different species of algae are able to withstand different amounts of time of being exposed. <coughs> so in this chart on the left-hand side, we have the intertidal height, right? This is the distance in meters from the uh, low tide line. And um, this is uh, the hundreds of hours of exposure in six months. Okay, so basically what we're looking at, say down here, this is at the, at the low tide line. You can see at the low tide line, they spend very little time exposed to the air and the majority of the time submerged underwater say half a meter above the low tide line, they spend a little bit more time uh, exposed to air, but still spend the majority of their time submerged underwater. Here at about one meter above low, the uh, low tide line, they spend about half of the time exposed to air, half the time submerged. And here maybe at two meters above low tide, low tide line, they spend the majority of the time exposed to air, and a small fraction of the time submerged. So these algae, species of algae along this coastline are adapted to different amounts of exposure time. Okay, so that's their niche, right? They don't have to compete with other species of algae at these different locations because they have figured out how to, through evolution, they are adapted to those different exposure times. So they have adapted to fill a niche. And so these are the, 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 the largest primary producers of these rocky intertidal environment, uh, communities. So rocky intertidal habitats are very inviting to life. Uh, they have a lot of, a large number of diversities of organisms living in those communities. What about sandy beaches? What do you think? I think sandy beaches are good for Organisms. We have a large number and diversity of organisms living on sandy beaches. I would say no. No, right? So even though sandy beaches look more inviting to us, right? They're nice. You can lay on them. Uh, they're not that inviting to life. Nothing there. Nothing there, right? Here are some uh, bean clams on a sandy beach, but but there's nothing. There's nowhere to hide, right? To get away from the waves, you're just on the sand. 
Uh, every time a wave comes in, it moves sand with it, and that sand's abrasive, so it's going to wear at your shell, at your body. Um, there's, no, there's nowhere really to hide to ambush prey if you're a predator. There's nowhere to hide from predators if you're prey, right? In the sand, you make tracks, and so they can just track you if you burrow. Um, so but there are some organisms, right? There's sand crabs and stuff that live on sandy beaches. So there are some organisms, but there's not nearly the number and diversity of organisms that live on sandy beaches as in these intertidal uh, communities along sandy beaches that live in um, rocky intertidal communities. Okay. Any questions? And that brings us to coral animals. So uh, corals, they build reefs, okay, these structures known as reefs. And they build them because corals make an exoskeleton out of material called calcium carbonate. That's the same material that clam, oyster, um, and, and um, scallop shells and snail shells are made out of calcium carbonate. Uh, so whenever people see coral, they see these big structures, and they think that's the actual coral. That's not the coral, that's their exoskeleton. The coral live inside of that, and, they're, and the actual animals, because coral are animals, uh, they're called polyps, and they live inside polyps. 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 Sometimes you can see the, the coral polyps stick out of the ends of the uh, exoskeletons. And then they build these exoskeletons and they might and they build them up towards the sea floor so there's more light. Why do they want light? Well, since coral are animals, uh, most animals that are fixed on the sea floor that are that are sessile like corals, they uh, obtain food by filtering particles of, of food out of the water. Well, coral don't really do that. Because they developed an interesting relationship with a type of phytoplankton called dinoflagellates. Um, they have a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with these dinoflagellates where the dinoflagellates, these phytoplankton, live in the calcareous, the calcium carbonate exoskeletons of the coral with the polyps. And so the coral provide basically a shelter for these plankton. And in return, these plankton photosynthesize which produce sugars, and they share some of those sugars with the coral polyps. So they make food for the coral. And so they have this nice symbiotic relationship. The coral gives them shelter. The, uh, the coral gives the dinoflagellates shelter. The dinoflagellates give the coral food. The dinoflagellates also help regulate the pH of the uh, water around the coral because if the pH becomes too low, the calcium carbonate will begin to uh, dis dis dissolve or algae could start to grow on the coral. Okay, and, and, and that's not healthy for the coral to have algae grow on it. This relationship, though, requires pretty particular or specific conditions. Okay, the water has to be around 21 degrees centigrade or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is fairly warm. And fresh water is extremely lethal to the dinoflagellates and, and the coral. Uh, you can see here's uh, distribution of coral reefs. Uh, and so you see most coral reefs are in this equatorial band in the tropics where the water is relatively warm. There are some so, uh, um, solo corals, they're not communal, that live in cooler, uh, cooler waters and deeper deep water corals. So those corals, they uh, obviously, they have a different way of obtaining food. They don't depend upon the dinoflagellates because they don't live in water that's too cold or too deep for those dinoflagellates. But most coral that build these large reefs, like the Great Barrier Reef, okay, they uh, have that symbiotic relationship with those dinoflagellates. And so here you can see a coral reef habitat. So coral reefs are another benthic habitat that act, often act as oases within the ocean. That there's a large, in these tropical oceans, I'm going to go back to the side, where usually there's not a lot of life. Uh, around these coral reefs, there uh, could be an oasis of life because these coral reefs 
are a source of a lot of primary productivity in which uh, builds an ecosystem up around them. So you'll have uh, some corals in the middle of the ocean where they're be in the middle of these tropical oceans where there's very little life anywhere else, but you'll have a coral reef and it'll just be teeming with life around the reef. And you'll have sharks that just live around that reef. They're eating fish. That's eating smaller fish to live around that reef. And it all it works all the way down to the uh, primary producers on the reef. And so reefs are always, uh, especially the, these coral reefs the, the, uh, formed by the coral liver with the dinoflagellates, they have to be in the euphotic zone. They have to be in the shallowest part of the ocean where there's enough sunlight for photosynthesis. And that's how what's called an atoll forms. An atoll is a coral reef that's usually in like a ring shape uh, in the middle of the ocean. So in the, say in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, there's, a, there's an atoll called Johnson Atoll. It's just a coral reef in the middle of the ocean. And for a long time, people wondered, well, these coral, they need light because the dinoflagellates, they, they need to photosynthesize. How are these coral living in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Because the water is very deep, right? And so these coral reefs can't be extending all the way from the deep sea floor. And so it was actually Charles Darwin that figured out how they form. Uh, first, there was a, a volcano, okay, from tectonic activity. That volcano was above sea level, and the coral um, took hold on the coast of that, on that volcano. And then as the volcano subsided, as it went extinct due to erosion, the coral continued to build itself up. It built more and more exoskeleton and built itself up so it can stay close to the sea surface where there's photosynthesis. And as the island subsided, the coral kept on building up uh, so that it remained close to the sea floor. So that now what it looks like is there's just this ring of coral in the open ocean. And there used to be an island there. And so it starts off as a fringing reef. And then it's a barrier reef. So this reef surrounds a smaller island. And then it becomes an atoll, a ring-shaped island, a coral reef enclosing a lagoon. Okay. And so these coral are threatened. I'm sure some of you might have heard about it. That coral in the ocean are dying. Uh, and this process is called coral uh, bleaching. Uh, and this happens is because here we can see this is a uh, healthy coral over here on the left. And you can see the darker color in the coral is actually caused by uh, the phytoplankton living in among the coral. Okay. So these are different polyps living in the coral and the phytoplankton are in with the polyps. And this is just a species of, of uh, those dinoflagellates, this uh, zooxanthellae. What happens is the water temperature increases too much. Those dinoflagellates, they, they leave the coral. They leave because it's too warm for them. And those dinoflagellates, which were given uh, which is necessary for the coral to survive because they produce food for the coral. They leave, the coral becomes white, okay? Because that's the color of calcium carbonate, white, the color of a clamshell. And if the temperatures return to normal temperatures, again, those dinoflagellates could return and the coral could be healthy, become healthy again. But if the dinoflagellates are gone too long, the coral will eventually starve and die. And while those Dinoflagellates are gone. They're no longer maintaining uh, the pH as necessary to fend off algae growth on the coral. And eventually algae will begin to grow on the coral. And once algae grows on the coral, that's pretty much it, right? That's dead coral. Bleached coral could come back uh, if the temperatures uh, return. But uh, if algae grows in the coral, the coral is then dead. 
okay? That's coral bleaching, and it's happening all over the planet as sea temperatures rise and the coral are dying. And these coral reefs are very important benthic habitats in the ocean. And then another benthic habitat are these abyssal plains, okay? The abyssal plains are the deep sea floors. Now, abyssal plains are in the, they're in the aphotic zone, which means it's perpetually dark, and they're at, uh, on the bottom of the seafloor where it's perpetually dark, the water is very cold. And, um, and it's also uh, a very large amount of pressure. Okay, so if you would take one of these abyssal uh, benthic organisms and brought them to the surface, it, they'd probably explode, right? Because their bodies are designed to live their entire lives under those great pressures. But because it's so cold, if you remember, we talked about life in the ocean, the metabolic rate of an organism is the, determined by its internal temperature. And the higher the body temperature, the higher the metabolic rate, the lower the body temperature, the lower the metabolic rate. So because these uh, organisms that live on the abyssal uh, plains live in such cold water, they have very, very low metabolic rates. So that means they move very slowly. They only need to eat in, uh, very infrequently because they don't use their food very fast. And because their just functions of life are so slow, they can live to be hundreds of years old. Okay, and so here is a, a sea cucumber. Okay, So you can see some sea cucumbers here on the deep sea floor. And there's also some brittle stars. Let's see here. And here's an example of this thumb-sized uh, crustacean that lives on the deep sea floor in uh, the Kermadec Trench off the coast of North, uh, that's uh, north of New Zealand, sorry, it's an it's a oceanic, oceanic subduction zone trench. It's actually blind, right? Other crustaceans have eyes, but this crustacean is blind because there's no need for eyes. It's perpetually dark. Um, and so the largest source of food is basically, it's called marine snow, it's just organic matter, so the waste and the remains of organisms that live in the photic and euphotic zone, sorry, the, in the photic zone, the euphotic and the dysphotic zone, you know, as those organisms die and their carcasses rot and they settle to the sea floor and the excrement of those organisms settle to the sea floor, that's what these organisms eat. So they're basically the garbage crew of the ocean, right? They're cleaning up the scraps in the sea floor. Yep. Um, so those are those abyssal benthic animals. Also in the <clears throat> in the uh, aphotic zone on deep sea floors, you'll have benthic communities that live around deep sea vents. So deep sea vents is where there's uh, magma close to the surface, which heats water uh, and causes the water to dissolve minerals and then the water comes to the surface and erupts and it brings those dissolved chemicals, dissolved minerals into the water. And those, uh, those minerals, sorry, those dissolved chemicals in the water uh, provide energy for chemosynthesis. So chemosynthetic organisms are able to create organic molecules using the energy uh, stored in these chemical compounds. And those chemosynthetic organisms act as the primary producers that are the foundation of an ecosystem that develops around these deep sea vents. Mm -hmm. So here you have these organisms that live in all around these deep sea vents. These deep sea vents are isolated. They, most of them are along um, mid-ocean ridges or you have volcanism, molten rock near the, uh, just beneath the surface or at hot spots, okay? Anywhere where you have uh, molten rock just beneath the surface that's heating that water. So you have tube worms, and here you have some, uh, some clams. But this whole ecosystem, the foundation of it, the, there's no photosynthesis, right? So the primary producers cannot be use photosynthesis and use chemosynthesis. And the reason why they exist there is because those chemicals are being 
uh, erupted out from the seafloor at these deep sea vents. Uh, and then the chemosynthetic uh, bacteria, they create uh, Food, they you know create their bodies using that, and then that's the base of the food web. And then organisms eat the bacteria, and uh, that just that energy works its way up to the trophic pyramid in these in this particular benthic uh, habitat. Then you have these bacterial mats, uh, or what's called a cold seep. It's where just water just seeps out of the sea floor, and with it brings dissolved chemicals, dissolved minerals. That bacteria use uh, to make their bodies um, and, what's, and also chemosynthesis. There's just these mats of bacteria that live along the seafloor. Now they're kind of scattered all over the ocean, these, these uh, cold seeps, and uh, scientists are not exactly sure how bacteria get from one to the other because they can be separated by kilometers, right? And it's thought that maybe these bacteria are washed by moving water and they can make it from one cold seep to another by by landing on say carcasses of dead animals living around those carcasses and then being washed to another carcass and then eventually they might find another cold seep but uh, these are another uh, example of a benthic habitat uh, this is obviously in the abyssal plains and sea floor and so uh, Chemosynthesis is the process used in the primary production. <clears throat> and that concludes our lecture on benthic communities. Good job, everybody. Any questions? I mean, you know, I'm amazed that like, pollution, you know, I mean, and, and these pollution things would always see and animals and plants and all that, but you look at the amount of pollution that is getting tossed into the 